name's Taylor Morris, and I grew up right here in Cedar Falls, Iowa. Went to Cedar Falls High School. And after high school, I joined the Navy and did a job called Explosive Ordnance Disposal, or EOD. And EOD's responsibilities are to respond to incidents involving chemical, biological, radioactive, nuclear, and explosive weapons and devices. In addition, the Navy's responsibilities involve also underwater ordnance. And um, so we go to dive school and we get trained on scuba as well as this rebreather rig that's shown here. In addition to that, we go to jump school to ensure that we can get ourselves and our gear any place at any time. One central theme from the very beginning of training that they drove into us was to constantly improve your situation. And this started out with things as simple as making a space a better place or making it better when you left than it was when you got it. So that applied to any break room, any barracks room we stayed in, any common area that we were in. The idea being just to make an improvement from how you got it so you turn it over to the next guy better than when you got it. Pretty simple. I deployed to Afghanistan in the winter of 2012. Very, very remote forward operating base way out in the mountains. I mean, there was two feet of snow on the ground when we got there. It was very cold. We were living in tents. And uh, it was so remote that if you needed your truck towed, you couldn't just call in a tow truck. You had to call in a helicopter to come tow it away for you. In addition, the roads were so bad to get there that the military wasn't even authorized to drive on them because of all the roadside bombs and improvised explosive devices that were buried along the route. So all of our resupply had to come in by air. Every couple of weeks or every week, a big airplane would fly over, open up the back door, and dump out all of our consumable resupply items. So that was all of our food and water and ammo and fuel and all the important stuff. So not exactly your retirement destination. <laughs> and we could definitely exercise this central theme of improving our situation. And we did. Anytime we weren't doing something that was mission focused. We were calling up the main base to get a delivery of plywood and two by fours so we could build hard structures and get out of the tents. Or we were digging a well so we could reduce our dependency on bottled water. About halfway through the deployment, I stepped on an IED, an explosive that was buried in the ground, a homemade device, and got hurt pretty bad. Lost parts of all four limbs. They medevaced me to a hospital there in Kandahar, Kandahar, Afghanistan. It was called Kandahar Airfield. Did my first initial round of surgeries there and cleanouts. Then I flew to Germany a day later and got more surgeries done and more cleanouts. And then a day after that, they flew me to the United States to Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. And that's where I would do my recovery for the next couple of years. I went from being one of the most independent people out there to 100% dependent on another person. And that really took a toll. It was, it was hard to do. I mean, imagine how often you use your arms and legs. That's how you interact with, with the entire world. And that was no longer an option for me. So I wanted to stick with this theme of improving your situation. And I was still in the hospital bed. My body wasn't ready for prosthetics yet. I was, it was still too swollen. I had stitches that needed to heal. So they wouldn't fit me for them yet. But I asked the occupational therapist what, what my options were. What could I do right now to improve where I was at, to get back a little independence so I could start doing stuff on my own. So here's what I was working with. No arms, no legs. Smoking hot girlfriend, that's Danielle. She's my fiance now. She's running the clicker back there. <laughs> that's what I was working with. And the first thing that we came up with was this, um, it was a knife that was taped to my arm. 
and it looks like I was cutting up a sub sandwich, which I don't know why we did that. I think uh, probably would have been easier to eat it without cutting it up. <laughs> but it was, uh, it, was, it was a good try. It didn't last very long. It was kind of dangerous to eat with, you know. I was still swinging around a knife, so. Uh, Mod 2 came out, and this worked a little better. It was a swiveling, self-leveling spoon, and I had a spoon and a fork. And basically the way this worked was it would strap around my arm, and I could do it all on my own with my teeth, strap it around nice and tight, and then the heaviest part of the spoon always stayed kind of level to the ground. So I could take a big scoop of whatever, eat it, and it worked out pretty good. Here's a picture of what it looks like when it was on. Um, and then after this, I got a, an iPhone and taught myself to text with my nose, and then I got an iPad so I could surf the internet and watch Netflix. And if you can watch Netflix, surf the web, call and text your friends, and eat on your own, that's like 50% of life right there. <laughs> so eventually, my body got to the point where I could do the prosthetics, and I got fitted for them, started working that whole recovery process, learning all these new things, and I still wanted to make improvements. I still wanted all that stuff to just get better. So the good thing about Walter Reed was they kind of had an open door policy on their, on their prosthetic lab, in their prosthetic lab. So I could walk down there and say, hey, I had an idea for this or that, and they'd be like, all right, let's try it. That's how things get better. Let's try it. So one thing that I identified that I wanted more was more storage. And that's because I don't have feeling in this hand, right? It'll open and close, but I can't feel anything in it. So if I put it in my pocket, I can't feel what I'm grabbing. I can't tell if it's open or closed, and so there's no way to get anything out of there. So I wanted something that was out in front of me, nice and easy and open, easy to get to. So here's what we came up with. Here's a picture of my legs. My left one on the top is about five inches shorter. I lost about five extra inches of femur on that side. So I wanted to kill two birds with one stone and make them symmetrical and then use that extra space for a storage compartment. So here's a picture of what it looks like open and I keep a, a tool for the prosthetics in there. I keep my keys in there. Plenty of room for a phone or a wallet or whatever else you want to keep and then you close the hatch and you can't even tell. That's the set of legs that I'm wearing right now. Another thing that I wanted to, to improve on was picking up a pen. And that's because this, this hand doesn't function in a way where if there's a pen laying on the table, I can't get the fingers far enough around it to pick it up and then use it. And it makes for, you know, checking out at the grocery store or whatever, it, just a slow and awkward situation. So we stuck with the idea of the storage compartment. It had a new arm done. This had a latch that flips open, spring-loaded latch, and then inside it conceals a pin that's on a retractable ID lanyard. So I can bump it open, I can grab it with my teeth, put it into my hand, sign the receipt, and then when I let it go, it retracts back to the compartment, and I close it up and I can walk away. And it doesn't hold other people up, and it doesn't make it, you know, it makes it a smoother process. Last thing I'll say about the hand is it doesn't point very well. So if I'm trying to point at something, nobody knows whether to look at the thumb or look at the fingers. I can get the general direction, but you know, if I wanted to point at a number on a chalkboard, I needed something like a laser pointer built in. So I got with the guys from the Cedar Valley Makers Club. I'm sure you guys saw the booth out there with the 3D printer. And we used that 3D printer to print out a couple of mounts that were custom to fit the arm because it was kind of an odd shape. And that pyramid looking mount is the switch mount. The one above it holds the laser. And we mounted the switch right where my waistband hangs or meets my arm when it's hanging down. So basically I can be standing there like this. I can push into the waistband, flip it up and turn the laser on. And then when I want to turn it off, point it back down, push into the waistband and flip it off. Here's a picture of what it looks like from the front. But it was an awesome resource to have, but it was um, using the 3D printer was one of the only ways to, to get that done. And works great. Um, this is something that I came up with in the very beginning. I had it put on 
all my different arms. And it's basically, it's nothing new. It's, I didn't come up with anything new. I just came up with kind of a different way to use something that already exists. Really simple. And it's basically just a rollerblade strap on the back of my arm. So that's right back here. And before this, it was a solid carbon fiber strap. So this arm was just all one continuous piece that wrapped around the back. And the problem with that is it's like having a shoe without any shoelaces. You gotta make it loose enough that you can still get it on and get it off. But if you wanna do, do an activity or something where you need more suspension, this allows you to be able to tighten it down, ratchet it down tight as tight as you want it. So for instance, if I have to pick up something heavy or if I'm gonna go for a run and the arm's gonna perspire and potentially slip out, you know that's a situation where I'd wanna crank it down maybe a little bit tighter. There's a picture of it a little bit tighter. They look pretty much the same. Um, the last thing I want to tell you guys is the driving ramp. And this is something that we put together in the garage. It was very easy, very simple, made it out of scraps. Um, there's a picture of it installed in the car. I did do the DOT driving test with it, so it's kind of legit. But. <laughs> Before this, I was, I was using hand controls in a vehicle, and what that looked like was I had one hand on the steering wheel, the other hand was doing the gas and brake on a push-pull lever, and so to do the blinkers, they had these bump switches installed in the headrest, and so I'd have to rock my head back to turn the blinkers on, or the, the high beams were right in the middle, so you can imagine how annoying that would be, especially when Danielle's driving it and her ponytail's smoking this <laughs> high beam button. Annoying for everybody else, too, I'm sure, but... So we put this together, cheap, simple, easy. Um, here's a side view of it. Basically, we cut out the base to fit exactly into kind of the contour of the floor right there. So it doesn't need to be bolted in. It's not intrusive. The hand controls, it was a, a whole system where if something broke, nobody wanted to work on it, you know, because you got the medical things to worry about, and then you got the DOT things to worry about, and those are just two things that you know can probably cause you a lot of headaches if you do something wrong. So nobody would want to work on it. So here's a picture of my foot just uh, on, the, on the brake. It, it was also more intuitive because I didn't have to use the, the push-pull and learn a new way to drive. This was exactly how you would drive before. You just gas brake with your foot. So I was never very big on updating social media, posting, because of the security level that we had to maintain in EOD, that was just kind of a no-no, and I never really got into that. But after I got injured, we started a blog to keep all the family and all the friends back home updated on the situation. That way we didn't have to respond to 100 emails a day and 100 phone calls a day. We could just tell everybody to keep up on the blog. And we started to receive a bunch of feedback. And everybody wanted more pictures of this or videos of that or can you talk a little bit or email us and tell us how you did this or that. And we started to get a lot of feedback. And we started getting thousands of emails coming in with requests, different types of requests. And people also were saying that they, they wanted to share how, how this story helped them. It was feedback from amputees, from people with other disabilities or people with no disabilities, but they just liked the story or liked the attitude or liked the new ideas. They started connecting with it in a way that we never intended. We just wanted a recovery blog to keep everybody up to date, but people started to get more out of it than that, and it was something unintentional. We never saw that coming. So, challenge for the crowd. All this came from me trying to improve my situation. Share a story of me trying to improve my situation. Now, on to the challenge. Improve one thing in your current situation, whether that's at home, at work, at school, something new, something old, whatever. Pick one thing and improve it. We put together a website, situationimproved.com. It's nice and easy to navigate through, clean. We want to know who you are and what situation you improved, and how it affected you in ways you expected, and how it affected you in ways you didn't expect. Because you never know who's going to take 
what kind of value from these stories. So it's just a little experiment, but who knows how many people we can inspire if everybody shares their story of trying to improve their situation. Thank you.